I'm doing a series called Love Takes Guts. And every letter in guts stands for something. G was genuine, and today is unconditional. Unconditional. Or unfailing, that would work too. That, that love is unconditional. So we're all trying to figure out, I mean, any, you listen to the radio, any love song is about, a lot of them are about trying to make a relationship work, or, or we're all trying to work on friendships, and we're trying to learn how to be good um, members of a family, and we all are seeking community in a time where, where isolation, in spite of our connectedness on social media, isolation is really, really a problem. Because the connection that we have on social media is very surface. And, and I, I always, okay, this wasn't part of my sermon, but it just came to my mind, which is dangerous. <laughs> but Emma and I were joking about our friends on Facebook who only post the really happy, wonderful stuff that makes me feel bad about my life. You know, <laughs> like, okay, I need to just get off of here. So, um, so, so we're trying to get to a deeper meaning in our relationship, deeper community, whether it be with our families or with our church family. But God has some ideas about what that looks like. And last week we learned that it was genuine. And today we're learning that it's unconditional. Colossians 3, starting with verse 12, going to 14. So as those who have been chosen of God... Holy and beloved, put on a heart of compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience, bearing with one another and forgiving each other. Whoever has a complaint against anyone, just as the Lord forgave you, so also should you. Beyond all these things, put on love, which is the perfect bond of unity. The Lord bless the reading of his word. His name is Bill, he has wild hair, wears a t-shirt with holes in it, jeans, and no shoes. This was literally his wardrobe for his entire four years of college. He is kind of esoteric and very, very bright. He became a Christian while attending college. Across the street from the campus is a church, the members of which are very well dressed and very conservative. They want to develop a ministry to the students but aren't sure about how to go about it. One day, Bill decides to visit that church. He walks in wearing his jeans, t-shirt, wild hair, no shoes, and starts down the center aisle looking for a place to sit. The church is completely packed and he can't find a seat. The members look a bit uncomfortable, but no one says anything. Bill gets closer and closer to the pulpit and when he realizes that there are no seats left, he just sits down on the carpet. <laughs> By now, the members are kind of uptight. Tension is in the air. Then from the back of the church, a deacon slowly makes his way toward Bill. Now in his 80s, the deacon has silver gray hair, a three-piece suit, and a pocket watch. He's a godly man, very elegant, very dignified, very courtly. He walks with a cane, and as he heads toward Bill, all the members are saying to themselves, you can't blame him for what he's going to do. How can you expect a man of his age and background to understand a college kid sitting on the floor? It takes a long time for the old man to get down the aisle. All eyes are focused on him. The church is utterly silent. The minister can't even begin preaching until the deacon does what he has to do. When he reaches the front, the congregation watches as he, with great difficulty, lowers himself and sits down next to Bill so he won't be alone. When the minister gains control of himself, he says, What I'm about to preach, you will never remember. What you have just seen, you will never forget. That, my friends, is an example of acceptance, <clears throat> unconditional acceptance, Unconditional love, if you will. We crave it. We desire it. But sometimes we're not as quick as this deacon to give it. We all want people who will care for us and people who will stand up for us in bad times. And we want people to accept us instead of criticizing and judging us. I want it. So does the community that surrounds us. 
The people out there, that's what they want. People are looking for it, a place where they're free to make mistakes and learn from those mistakes and grow from them. And that's the kind of place that the church needs to be. I think that's the kind of place that Christ intended the church to be. And if we are truly becoming a community, those lives that come into our door will be changed if we're that kind of place where God's love is flowing in abundance, grace is present, and acceptance is the mode of the day or the operation of the day. John 13 says, a new command, I give you love one another as I have loved you so that you must love one another. And by this, all men will know that you're my disciples. Now, the church is kind of getting a bad rap these days. And a lot of it's deserved. Anybody see all the things that are coming up in the news about the Baptist churches that have been hiding the sexual abuse, hundreds and hundreds of people? I want to say American Baptists have been kind of ahead of that wheel, re requiring training. Actually, here's a story. When Jeff and I first started dating, I kept wondering, is it ethical for me to date somebody in my congregation? So right after he asked me out for the first time, I went to a healthy boundaries class that our denomination required. And in that boundaries class, they gave three criteria for when it was okay for a minister to date a congregant. And the three criteria were, you can't be in secret, okay? You have to do it out, out loud. Um, you can't be their pastor. To Ching, I was the associate. Fred was another pastor. He could be Jeff's pastor. So second criteria met. Third criteria was, if it doesn't work out, be prepared to leave. I went for it. <laughs> it worked out. But it was totally within healthy boundaries. And all of this comes from, over the course of time, unhealthy boundaries that have led to mistakes and, and, and issues surrounding human relationships and ministers. So American Baptists have been on it. That was 20 plus years ago. I just got a message this week. I've got to take it again because they want everybody to take it again. Because there's new stuff. There's, there's the uh, Me Too movement. There's things to talk about, about what's inappropriate and what's appropriate. So another issue is uh, protecting our children. And um, in the last 20 years, a lot has changed in terms of how you do your Sunday school. And um, I want to lift up Mary because she's been on getting us involved in Protect My Ministry, which will get us, um, our, our people working with children will have background checks and we'll have those on file. Practices like you don't ever have uh, a teacher in a room alone with kids if you do the doors open or there's always two teachers. So anyway, there are church organizations that haven't been this open about it. Um, the church is, is, is railing from ministers, priests, clergy around the world who, who haven't always been or had such good boundaries. That's one of the reasons the church is struggling, but the church is getting a bad rap for a lot of reasons. Um, churches that are just ugly, uh, that make the news, one little tiny church in far, far away that stands up at a, uh, a, a dead soldier's funeral saying that it's God's judgment. I mean, I don't know if Westboro Baptist giving us a bad name, okay? We are dealing with people who don't have firsthand knowledge of faith. In the 80s, the generation that we had in the church as teens probably had at least one immediate family member that had experience in the church. Oftentimes that was grandma. 
Now we're into generations who have no connection to the organized church. And the only representation that they see is what they see in the news or at school or whatever. So we have our work cut out for us. But what an opportunity for us to live this lesson today about unconditional love. The only thing that will redefine the church for today is one-on-one -on -one individual unapologetic un love. On Facebook, I get a lot of sermon fodder on Facebook, my cousin, not a church person, the only experience with church is, is me uh, being her cousin, her grandmother, who was my grandmother, and her husband who had left the faith that he knew as a child, posted on Facebook about why do churches get tax exempt status? And they, of course, brought up, they said some really, really unkind things about church. And they talked about mega churches, and I don't even have to fill in the blank, you name them. And, and I got on there. And I said, okay, guys, you need to know that those churches are few and far between. I said, my church is small, but we are loving and mighty, and we don't take people's money and use it for bad things. Or I mean, I'm not driving a Lamborghini. And, um, you know, so, so when you talk to teenagers today, they are very disillusioned about the concept of church. Spirituality is, is increasing daily, but religion is decreasing if you ask people in our culture and society. We have our work cut out for us, okay? So that's why I feel like this lesson is so important, so important. I want to tell you a story uh, that comes out of Moody uh, Church in Chicago. In the days when the great evangelist Moody was preaching in Chicago, a man partially under the influence of liquor, seeing the warm lights of Moody's tabernacle, staggered up the steps to the front door. Upon opening it, opening it he saw no one within, but he did see a motto hanging above the pulpit that said, God is love. The man slammed the door and staggered down the steps and muttered to himself, God is love. God is not love. If God were love, he would love me, and he hates me. He continued his uneven walk around the block, still muttering to himself, but those words began to burn images into his benumbed thinking. A power seemed to draw him back to the tabernacle. With the throngs that were now making their way into the tabernacle, he soon found himself seated inside, and Mr. Moody was preaching. The sermon over Moody made his way to the door to shake hands with the people as they left, but this man didn't leave. He continued to sit in his seat, weeping. Moody came up to him, put his arm on the man's shoulder, and asked, Is there something I can do for you? What was in it, my sermon that touched your heart? Oh, Mr. Moody, I didn't hear a word that you spoke tonight. <laughs> the man responded, It's those words up there over your pulpit. God is love. Friend, God is love. Moody sat down and talked with him for a while, and soon he gave his heart to Moody's God. God is love. All his ways and acts are love. Until we love our community unconditionally as God loves us, then we will never be a true community church. The most powerful argument for our faith the most powerful argument for our faith is not the eloquence of the preacher or the slickness of a brochure, but the evidence of love. Amen. If we love this community, it will be noticed and the community will respond. Wow. Okay, another confession. 20 years ago, I would have said, what you messing with that mealy mouth love stuff? Let's do discipleship. <laughs> discipleship. Fill in the blank on this worksheet. Memorize this text. And then you'll really be a Christian. 
And then that whole concept of community, what you talking about community, that's so fluffy, that doesn't mean anything. I have learned about the power of community. It is not fluff. It is one another, holding each other up. We may not have the ability to make everything okay, but we can do our part, we can lift you up, we can love you. And leave that up to God. We may not agree with everything you do or say, but I'm not. Let's give that to the Holy Spirit. In Ephesians, it says, Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. To bear with one another means sometimes turning a blind eye to each other's faults. It means being quick to praise and slow to criticize. We will from time to time find people in our community that are less than ideal. And when that time comes, we must make every effort to accept them where they are and show them Christ's love. I'm, I'm constantly confronted with my issues when I'm dealing with people, particularly in our work downtown. To build community, we have to be willing to accept people as they are without nitpicking or choosing to mount a crusade to fix them. Okay, you guys, here's the truth for today. You cannot fix anybody. Only Jesus can and themselves. We can show up. We can be with. We can assist. We can sit beside. We can bring them to Jesus. We can bring Jesus to them. We can pray. We can give words of encouragement. But we cannot fix anybody. Amen. We present them with the truth of the gospel and allow God to change them. We have enough keeping our own lives straight that we really don't have time to straighten out somebody else's. <laughs> to build community, we don't waste our time pointing out the many ways those folks in our community fall short. We choose instead to treat them with patience, kindness, compassion, gentleness, and love. Nor do we judge. It's not our place to judge, but that is the place of God, according to James 4. That says the brothers and sisters do not slander one another. Anyone who speaks against a brother or sister or judge them speaks against the law and judges it. When you judge the law, you are not keeping it, but sitting in judgment on it. There is only one lawgiver and judge, the one who is able to save and destroy. But you, who are you to judge your neighbor? James chapter 4. Listen to this poem. I was shocked, confused, bewildered as I entered heaven's door. Not by the beauty of it all, by the lights or its decor, but it was the folks in heaven who made me sputter and gasp. The thieves, the liars, the sinners, the alcoholics, the trash. There stood the kid from seventh grade who swiped my lunch money twice. Next to him was my old neighbor who never said anything nice. Herb, who I always thought was rotting away in hell, was sitting pretty on cloud nine, looking incredibly well. <laughs> I nudged Jesus, what's the deal? I would love to hear your take. How'd all these sinners get up here? God must have made a mistake. And why is everyone so quiet, so somber? Give me a clue. Hush, child, said he. They're all in shock. No one thought they'd see you. <laughs> I could end right there. <laughs> Only God has the right to judge. When we take on positions of judgment, we are taking on the position of God. I can only speak for myself, but I'm here to tell you I'm not qualified. And I suspect you are not either. Looking at our community, we have to realize that we're a little bit like ice cream. Some of us are vanilla, some of us are strawberry, some of us are butter pecan. 
Some of us are chocolate chip. Some of us have add-ins that make our heritage different or make our experience different. But isn't it wonderful the many different ways that there is ice cream? Oh my gosh, I don't know if there's anything I like more in life than ice cream. And what if we didn't have all that diversity? Wouldn't it be boring? And there is no right flavor. There is no right mix in. Some people may want to put things in their ice cream that you would think is awful. But other people really love it. The main thing we need to keep in mind is that no one is the same flavor. We all have different things added. However, we started from the same source. We all started from the same source. Cream, sugar, mixing, not sure what else. <laughs> Probably something really fattening. This brings richness to our community and we want this, we want this. So the next time a believer in Jesus rubs you the wrong way or acts differently or tries to keep ice cream, try to keep ice cream in mind. God made that flavor just the way it is. And it has no right to try to be any other flavor or mixture. And we don't have a right to try to throw in our ingredients to improve its taste. Let's welcome the differences and the flavors and, and maybe we can come in unity and love and acceptance and show the community what the church really is. That's my dream and my hope. Let's pray. Gracious God.